At the turn of the 20th century, in a small town in Midwestern America, a formula was stumbled on that changed the way the world ate breakfast. The man at the center of it all had dropped out of school. Nobody had any faith in him, not even his family. But he relentlessly pursued his vision and turned this formula into a brand that now lines an aisle of every supermarket. This is the story of Will Keith Kellogg. Will Keith Kellogg was born in 1860 in the town of Battle Creek, Michigan, about 160 miles from Chicago. He was one of 11 children born to Anne Jeanette Stanley and John Preston Kellogg. Throughout his childhood, Will grew up surrounded by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which had been newly formed in the area. One thing that was instilled in him was hard work. Will began working at age seven, paying for his own clothes, this connection to the church, as well as his work ethic, would be essential in his later business career. At school, Will struggled. His teachers remarked that he was much slower than his classmates, who Will was distant from. He was reportedly a quiet child, who kept to himself. And because of his father's religious beliefs that the apocalypse was imminent, Will wasn't encouraged to pursue studies, and at that time, only elementary school was compulsory for children. The growing Seventh-day Adventist community in Battle Creek drew Will away from school. And without support or academic prospects, he dropped out at the age of 13 to join his father's company, a broom manufacturer as a traveling salesman. Will had much more success as a salesman than in school, staying with the company for nine years until he was hired by a competitor firm in Dallas, Texas. But less than a year later, in 1879, he was summoned home to his hometown to join his brother, John Harvey, in running the Battle Creek Sanitarium, which was intimately tied to the church. This was where his fortunes would change. The sanitarium had been started in 1866 as an institution to promote the health practices of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, under the leadership of John Harvey Kellogg. It was mainly a health resort for soldiers injured in the war, but later became a hotel for the wealthy. Unlike Will, John Harvey was an academically gifted man who was a fierce theological advocate as well as a practicing medical doctor. Although he was pulled out of school, similarly to Will, John had achieved advanced literacy by himself and a university education through a family friend's sponsorship. His work at the sanitarium hoped to combine hydrotherapy, vegetarianism, as well as abstinence from alcohol and tobacco, in line with the views of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When Will arrived, John Harvey had already been managing it for three years, and in that time developed a chewable breakfast food, which he called granula. It was a combination of oats, corn, and wheat, which was baked, cooled, and broken into crumbs. After running into legal troubles, the product's name was changed to granola. Will helped carry out all of the odd jobs of the sanitarium, including as a bookkeeper, shipping clerk, cashier, and an assistant in John's experiments into different kinds of healthy foods. In 1894, their work culminated in a product that gave birth to an entire industry. After accidentally leaving some wheat berry dough outside one night, they decided to experiment rather than discard the produce. The wheat was rolled out into thin sheets, which produced flakes, perfect for baking. Will repeated the steps until they both understood the process. Using fermentation with high temperatures was the secret behind the flakes. What Kellogg's had just created was the basis of flaked cereal, now known simply as cereal. After introducing them to the sanitarium, the flakes became so popular that ex-patients ordered them after they returned home too. Virtually all of the breakfast cereals lining the aisles of your local supermarket still use this fundamental technique to this day. The Kellogg brothers could smell the power of their idea. They filed a patent in 1895 entitled Flake Cereals and Process of Preparing Same, and formed the Sanitas Food Company two years later, producing whole grain cereals. But diverging ambitions caused William and John to fall out. While William wanted to expand the business and proposed ideas like adding sugar to make the product more appealing, his brother refused. John was committed to adhering to the same religious principles that he advocated in the sanitarium, which meant healthy and sugarless products. And with the sanitarium attracting the rich and famous, John didn't need more money, already living in a large mansion nearby. 
He even allowed observers to watch the cereal process. This helped Charles William Post, a rival manufacturer, launch his business. Eventually, the growing conflicts were too much, and the two brothers split ways. In 1906, Will launched his own company, which he called Battle Creek Toasted Corn Flake Company. But Will suffered many early setbacks with his new company. For one, he didn't officially have the right to the technique for manufacturing cereal. The patent filed in 1895 was under his brother's name. To make things worse, a year after going into business, Will suffered a devastating factory in 1907, but was able to rebound and reconstruct it within six months. Will was determined to make it work, and the key to his plan coming to fruition was earning the rights to his brother's patent. In the years after his factory fire, he was able to convince him. With the family name behind him, he renamed the company Kellogg Toasted Corn Flake Company. Sales were growing exponentially, and by 1909, the company was selling 120,000 cases each day. But the success didn't come without problems. When his brother John created another cereal brand called Kellogg's, Will sued him for the rights to the family name. At the time, John was down on his luck and had also been kicked out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a cause he had dedicated his life to. The legal battle dragged on for almost a decade. Will summarized his case in an interview telling the media, Everybody who hears the name Kellogg's thinks of cornflakes now. In the end, Michigan Supreme Court finally ruled in Will's favor. Despite inviting his brother into the sanitarium and by most accounts creating the flake cereal process, John Harvey Kellogg became a stepping stone for the more ambitious Will. Later accounts have revealed how John mistreated Will throughout his employment at the sanitarium, paying his brother less than $90 a month while the institution grossed over $4 million annually. From then, he got to work strengthening the business. The Kellogg's name was now Will's to use, and he widened that power to make himself enormously rich. Before the Kellogg brothers created flaked cereal, the average American breakfast would involve potatoes and meat, often fried. The most straightforward meal available was porridge, but this was time-consuming, taking hours to soften under a wood-burning stove. Will Kellogg could see that the appetite for an alternative was widespread. What he lacked in school smarts was more than compensated for by his cunning business instinct. In 1922, he renamed the business simply Kellogg's, and his impact was immortalized with his signature, which is still the logo of the company. He continued experimenting with the recipe and found a way to make the flakes even crispier. Now that he was independent of his brother's health-conscious influence, he could add sugar, a vital ingredient for success. Will invested heavily in advertising, throwing millions of dollars into the pursuit of making Kellogg's a synonym for cereal and breakfast. Ingeniously, he used the large cardboard boxes that he packaged his cereal in for artwork that promoted his company, inviting famous artists to design different versions. Kellogg's was also one of the first companies to provide nutritional information on the back of their products, and he added prizes to the boxes to make the cereal more exciting. The concept of breakfast took off, with the Quaker Oats Company developing their own rice grain product to launch puffed rice and puffed wheat. Then came Wheaties and Cheerios. But after World War II, Kellogg's once again dominated the market with the release of Frosted Flakes. Paired with the character Tony the Tiger, Kellogg's was one of the first brands to utilize television for advertising. Will Kellogg died in 1951, choosing to dedicate much of his later life to horse racing and philanthropy. And after removing his son from the company and demoting his grandson, leadership fell out of the Kellogg family's hands. After Will's death, Kellogg's continued to expand. They pioneered a boom in the cereal industry in the 1970s, with an expansion of new flavors. In 1983, though, Kellogg's hit a historic low of 36% of the market share. Once again, advertising came to the rescue, tripling middle-aged cereal consumers in the late 80s. Kellogg's found that tying their products to TV shows, films, and toy brands was effective. In the early 2000s, this trend picked up. Kellogg's partnered with Spider-Man, SpongeBob SquarePants, The Incredibles, High School Musical, Star Trek, and many more media brands to market to children. And when the company completed a multi-billion dollar purchase of the Pringles brand from Procter & Gamble, it became the world's second largest snack food company. In 2020, Kellogg's had $13 billion in revenue 
and accounted for over almost 30% of total industry revenue, operating in 180 different countries. Kellogg's produces some of the world's most popular cereals, including All Bran, Cocoa Pops, Fruit Loops, Frosted Flakes, Oat Bran, Special K, and of course, the classic Corn Flakes, where it all began more than a century ago. Will had to betray his brother to become the Cereal King, but once he did, he never looked back, and their surname is cemented in food history because of his ambitious ideas.